Hello, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Charlie, and welcome to Democracy 4. This is a political simulation game that attempts to give you insight and control of the flow uh, within a political environment, and in many ways teach you of the complexities that come with being in a position of power. If you're familiar with Democracy 3 previously, well, you'll notice a lot of similarities with this game and that one. Uh, Democracy 4 adds new interface changes, balancing, and a load of other scenarios and elements to work with that kind of bring it up uh, more to speed with modern times a little bit here, I guess. The world moves fast. Uh, so we're going to work with, against, and move around um, and attempt to keep myself, uh, as well as my party at least, uh, in power and uh, hopefully better the world for my people. So uh, in the true spirit of politics, this video is bought and paid for. <laughs> yeah, uh, special thanks to Positech Games for sponsoring this video and letting me give a preview of what the game is all about uh, for all of you guys. And if you want to learn more about it, you can see it for yourself down in the description. It's now out of early access and available for you all uh, at release. Okay, hit new game. And I'm going to choose the United States of America. That's, uh, that's just where I'm going to be at. Um, but you can choose a lot of different uh, United Kingdom, Japan, France, Canada, Australia. These are countries that have all very different political environments, very different populations who have an acceptance and an expectation of very different things. And so that's the diversity of people. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and start in the United States here. I'm going to hit and play the game. And um, we have a difficulty percentage. We can make people more or less critical of us in different decisions, make them care about politics a little bit more, basically. Political apathy, kind of same thing. This is mostly how likely are they to vote? Uh, we can maybe sway that up. Who cares? Um, we have innate socialism, innate liberalism. These are very different things, by the way. Um, there's a very big sort of trend in the United States, especially, that bastardizes uh, and completely misunderstands what liberalism is and often equates it to socialism. So um, read up and do your own homework on that. They're very different things. Um, at least around the world, there are very different things. We have an economic cycle and then also our starting debt. Uh, and you can play around with a slider if you want to make it easier or harder, things like that. Okay, uh, so um, we have a uh, player party name. We're going to change this to the Hat Hut. <laughs> oh, whatever. Um, and then our uh, no going back party. Actually, I like the way it's named already. We're not even going to change it. So um, here, opposition party is called the no going back party. Um, we have compulsory voting can kind of force everyone to vote, I suppose. You must vote, or at least compulse them to vote. Uh, and we can also play with a three-party system if you prefer as well. Okay, so um, we have, I guess we're green. Um, they're red, we can change to another color if I want to. I don't really care, actually. I'm just gonna stay green. All right, play. So this is a very different game. Um, if you've never seen a democracy game before, then you're going to be very confused by this interface. So I'm going to spend some time walking you through how the interface works and making sure that you're up to speed on some of the things that you're seeing. Timestamps are in the video as well. So if you already know how the game works and stuff, you can uh, move around and things if you want to as well. Okay, congrats on election victory. Great. Here's the dire state of our nation. Very high unemployment, very high crime. Eh. It's okay on poverty, I guess, because they're so good at crime. <laughs> um, the GDP is unfavorable. We could we could improve that. Uh, health needs to be ri risen, and education needs to go up too. Um, let's begin our term in office. So right away, new players, new people who are not familiar with this, are going to be like, "Information overload, dude. What the heck is this? This is the core view of the game." Let's walk a little bit. Uh, we'll walk through it a little bit to kind of get you familiar with things and we'll kind of take it for a, a systematic spin, if you will. Uh, we'll start with the most obvious um, issues that, of the interface uh, that might be different. And that's all of these little bubbles, all these little circles. What are they? What do they do? How do I read this? Okay. Now there's different views for them too. So we can go through finances, value, policy, popularity, how big of influence they have, etc. But we're going to leave it as weighted for now. Here's what they ultimately are. We're divided up into different sections, right? Policy sections, if you will, right, of government. We have law and order, transportation, foreign policy, welfare, economy, tax, and public service. Each one of these has a bunch of different bubbles in them that ultimately go with that topic, as well as ministers that are in charge of running that sort of division of government, if you will. We have 16 political capital. This is like 
you can think of this as our primary currency. This is how we get things done. And a big contributor to how much political capital we have is the loyalty and effectiveness of well, not so much the effectiveness, but the loyalty of our ministers plays a critical role in that. We're going to look at that a little later in the video. For now, let's take a look at some of these big bubbles. What do they do, right? Let's start with a big percentage sign. This is income tax. When I hover over top of this, two things happen. One, we get all the clutter out of the way. And two, we get to see the inputs and outputs of that thing that we're hovering over. Now, in the case of income tax, there's really only outputs for this. And red, as you might assume, is negative, and green is positive. Now, that is not necessarily positive for people, positive for our government, positive for society. And it's not negative for society either. Instead, it's a positive or negative effect on whatever it's going to, okay? So in this case, high income tax, or income tax in general existing, has a negative effect on capitalists, has a negative effect on middle income, has a positive effect for the socialist crowd, and a negative effect on the wealthy crowd. It also has a negative impact on GDP, middle income earnings, high earnings, poor earnings, earnings in general, um, and also a low uh, or a, a negative impact on charity. But it also contributes positively to cryptocurrency adoption and equality. So those are the two things uh, that it really impacts uh, positively. Take a look at something else. How about we take a look at roads? So road building has a positive impact on car usage. The better the roads are, the more people are willing to drive. But that also has a negative contribution on traffic congestion. Now, traffic congestion is not a good thing. We don't want congestion. So having a negative impact on congestion is a good thing. Huh? It also has a negative impact on unemployment because we put people to work building roads. So a negative impact on a negative thing is actually kind of a positive thing for us, right? That's how you read this interface. Now, when you're in the weighted uh, way of reading them, you're going to see green and red. This is your ability to influence that particular circle, if you will, that particular policy. Um, so my political capital is directly related to my ability to do things in the game. So if I click this, we get a breakdown of what income tax is all about. You can see that it's not very popular with voters. It's one of those necessary evils. We have to make money so that we can spend money on the things that people care about. And the only way to get money is to get it from the people. So it's a collective circle. You contribute to government, government then comes back and contributes to you, and we need to find the balance there to make everybody happy. Here's a quick tip for you. You will not make everybody happy. Um, that is impossible because people have conflicting ideologies, they have conflicting interests, things that are good for some are bad for others, and vice versa. You will never make everyone happy. So the goal of the game is to keep yourself in power, to get reelected, and if you're playing with a purpose, and I tend to feel like it's better to play with a purpose, uh, achieving your goals that you've set out to do. So in this video, we're not gonna be able to actually achieve any goals because it's gonna take too long for the video, but I am gonna focus on implementing policies that improve the environment and also raise GDP while simultaneously not making capitalists upset at me. That is going to be very difficult to do, but we're gonna give it a shot because those three things are generally conflicting ideologies, right? Things that help improve the environment tend to reduce GDP a little bit. They tend to not make capitalists very happy because it restricts what they're able to do because of the environment, right? So you have to try to try to balance those things out. And that's what I'm gonna attempt to do in this particular video while I explain the interface. On the left side, we have uh, our total popularity, which somehow is very bad despite us just winning an election. Um, we can arrange these guys however we want, but these are different population sectors or different elements of our population, if you will. Of course, there's everyone and um, the bar is completely full with everyone. Um, notice there are two bars. There is a sort of a highlight, if you will, a shading sort of bar here that dictates the percentage of the population which falls within that particular classification. And then there's this more prominent bar which tells their favorability towards you, your popularity with that particular sector. So right away, we start out pretty popular with the poor, the patriots, the retired, and the socialists. 
yeah, somehow we managed to come out popular with socialists and patriots and the poor. Uh, and the retired as well. Uh, but also conservatives and uh, religious and capitalists, they don't like us as much. And that's a big deal for us for capitalism because capitalists currently possess, um, or at least possess, <laughs> you're possessed with capitalism. No, the current population percentage is 83.3%. Or 83% of the people would classify themselves as capitalists or at least aligning with capitalists, okay? That's a big deal because we have to make them happy if we wanna get reelected, right? So we're gonna to have to do some pro-capitalist things and make them happy, or we're gonna to need to implement policies that reduces the membership of capitalists, because you could do that too. So let's take a look at some of the things we can do to make capitalists happier, but also not hurt the environment. First thing I'm gonna do is I need to address my deficit. And this is currently $84.6 billion. That's not that bad, actually. Global economies on the rise, which is pretty good. Uh, our relative G GDP, though, is pretty stagnant, and capitalists will really like a good GDP. If I hover over top of GDP, you can see that GDP has a positive impact on capitalist approval ratings for us, right? Um, GDP is a very complicated thing. Um, a lot of things that you do will impact it, and a lot of things that you do uh, will seem not to impact it, but actually will impact it. Um, a good example of this would be to say, for example, a car tax. Now, a car tax, we would implement this. Um, that would reduce car usage, which is pretty okay. I mean, that's fine. Uh, motorists don't particularly like that that much, um, and farmers won't like that either. Um, but it's good for the environmentalists because it means less cars on the road. Less cars on the road will also mean that we reduce the positive impact or positive force we have on traffic congestion. Now remember, traffic congestion is a negative thing. So more cars on the road has a ra will rise, will raise traffic congestion, which is a bad thing. So this green line that's moving really, really fast, uh, you can see kind of behind bus usage. That is, it's green, but that doesn't mean it's positive for us. And where I'm getting with this and going full circle, traffic congestion has a negative impact on GDP, right? So even though we don't have a direct impact on GDP with car taxing, uh, car taxation, it does trickle over and have an impact on GDP anyway. So this is an overall statement on how well our economy is doing and generally, not always, but generally flows with the impact on how well our total citizens are doing, our, all of our citizens and our, all of our uh, constituents are doing. The better GDP uh, equals usually more prosperity, usually uh, in certain sects. Um, there's obviously there's little elements and exceptions to that, but that is the way it can go. Okay, um, important thing to note here before we really get started, and that is that people can align themselves with multiple uh, ideologies and also multiple uh, classifications. So for example, uh, a person who can considers himself a capitalist um, may also drive to work. So they are also a commuter. Um, I suppose if they're driving to work, they're a motorist. Um, they may also find themselves aligning as a conservative and maybe they have children. So in that situation, they're also parents. And so some policies might make certain people happy, but if that person also aligns with another section that's being negatively impacted by your populate, by what you're doing, um, then they may feel more negatively towards you. Let's take a look at this, for example, if I go up here and go to uh, eco home regulations, right? Increasing regulation, all right? Now, this is something that could help the environment, improve energy efficiency, all sorts of things. But it also means that certain parts of business, certain parts of manufacturing um, that would normally be cheaper now get more expensive. And ultimately, that's not good for the energy industry. And it's also not good for capitalists who want to increase their bottom line and make as much profit as possible it will have a negative impact on CO2 emissions. Now, CO2 emissions is a negative thing. We don't, we want to reduce negative, uh, we want to reduce CO2 emissions. So having a negative impact on CO2 emissions is of course a positive thing for us, right? That's how you can try to read this interface. It can get a little bit complicated, but we'll try and we'll try and make it work. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, I'm going to utilize some of my political capital to reshuffle my cabinet. I'm gonna take a look really quick at this. This is my cabinet ministers. Each one of these ministers are in charge of a certain sector of my uh, overall governance, if you will. We have foreign policy, welfare, economy, tax, public service, law and order, and transport. Same as all of these. 
these guys will dictate how much political capital I have to work with every turn. And a turn is a quarter of a year. So, United States, uh, every four years we have an election. Therefore, I have 16 turns to get everyone to vote for me, okay? If these guys don't necessarily like me much, their loyalty is low, they will produce less political capital for me, which means I'm less effective. I can do less things. And I really want to do a lot of things. So I'm going to try to reshuffle my cabinet here. Firing a minister is not usually a super bad thing. If you fire more than one, then you're kind of getting into problems. It'll kind of reduce everyone's job security goes down. They're not as loyal to you, etc. But you can get away with it slightly, especially if you just got elected, because uh, it's kind of free at that point. You can reshuffle your cabinet. Okay, so I can take the ones that are not as loyal and see if I can replace them with people who are more loyal couple of things to note about their loyalty. It changes over time. So they're not going to stay there. Depending on what you do, your ministers may like or dislike you more. Part of this is, has to do with their personal opinions. And a lot of it has to do with the sympathies that they have towards various types of people, their constituents. They're going to listen to people who are calling into their senators, etc., and saying, hey, this guy sucks, right? Or, hey, I really like that, you know, he did this thing. That can influence them as well. Every minister has two, I think it's always two people that they are sympathetic to. So this one is a sympathetic welfare here, uh, sympathetic to parents and liberals. So if you make parents and liberals happy, you tend to make this guy happy. If his loyalty increases, the amount of political capital uh, he provides to you will also increase. Likewise, if I make conservatives happy, well, then the Secretary of State here, who is aligned with liberals and socialists, well, they're not nah, they're not going to be as loyal to me anymore, right? They're going to start dropping. And as a result of that, they'll be less effective. So I'm going to go ahead and reshuffle cabinet for 10 political capital. And I'm going to, for the purposes of this video, this is not a long-term approach, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to try to get as much political capital as I can. So in that case, I'm going to find people who are loyal to me today, rather than trying to organize a group of people that will be loyal to me long-term. Generally, you should try to find a, a, a ground of people, an assortment of people who will be more loyal to you longer term, which tends to be the people who are more aligned with the people you're trying to make happy. If you're in the United States and you try to play this without making capitalists happy, you're going to have a hard time. It's just the way it is. Sorry, those of you who are not into capitalism, uh, that's the way this world, particularly over here, uh, kind of works. It's just the fact of the matter is. You can, over time, change that, though. This game gives you the tools to do that. You just need to implement policies that reduce the membership of capitalists. Uh, also, without getting assassinated and also getting reelected. Good luck. All right. So anyway, we're going to take these four here. And now we have welfare, economy, tax, and public services. We need to get more people here to represent these. Otherwise, we're not going to get any political capital from these. And we're not going to be able to do policies. So um, let's start with welfare. We're going to go to hire. Certain people want to be in our welfare department. So let's take a look at the new people. Brian Morris, he would de he desires to be part of foreign policy, law and order and welfare. So that's good. He aligns with socialists and state employees. Eh. Let's go welfare, youth and parents, etc. So you can find people that you want to work with you and go with it. For this particular example, I'm going to go with uh, this guy here just because he provides 2.1 political capital. And that's what I need right now. So. Again, not the best pick necessarily, but we're going to go with it for now. Economy. Let's take a look. Um, liberal middle income. I want to look for somebody who's really into capitalists because I need that. All right. Patri Patriot middle income. Fine. Okay. So this is where they're going to be. Okay. And this is, um, I think I got this guy in his desired job. Yeah. All right. So green across the board. That's what we're going to do for now. Not the best long-term approach, but that's what we're going to do for now. Um, the last thing I'm going to do before my turn is over, because I have six political capital left, is I'm going to take a look really quick at how we're funding things that relate to the GDP. And I am going to go, I think, with... Uh, let's take a look really quick at corruption. Let's see if we can reduce corruption a little bit. Let's take a look at press freedom really quick. Um, we can increase the freedom of the freedom of the press. This is going to take all of our capital just to like maximize that approach. Notice how these um, bars in the middle of the screen, they adjust as I slide this. There's also a green section and a red section. Red section means I do not have 
currently the political capital to influence that. So I won't be able to do that. But green, I can do. Sometimes it will cost more political capital to go one direction or another, depending on how popular the policy is. In this case, press freedom, very popular with voters, 100%. Doesn't happen very often where you have 100%, but everyone's unanimously in agreement that press freedom is a good thing to have. It means constitutional. So um, in that case, if I was to go like this and give them no freedom at all, that's very unpopular. And it's going to cost me a lot of political capital to do that. But raising it cost almost nothing relative. So you can see how as I increase this all the way to maximum, this will increase democracy, which is good for various other things. We can hover over that later if you'd like to. It will have a negative, an increased negative impact. Notice how it's right here. It increases the negative impact on corruption, which is a negative thing. We want a negative against a negative. That's a positive, right? <laughs> um, it will increase liberalism, uh, or it makes, sorry, it makes liberals happy, and it increases liberalism membership, okay? And again, I invite you to go back um, or go somewhere and actually get a proper definition of liberalism uh, because in the United States, most people do not equate that with what it actually means. Um, so it will increase uh, the happiness of liberals and it will also increase the membership of liberalism by doing that. Um, everyone has really no impact on this at all. And then the media monopoly gets reduced as well. All positive things takes six, but this is reducing corruption, which has a negative impact on GDP. So if we can reduce corruption, good. Let's hit apply. And we do this without raising taxes. Isn't that nice? Our deficit is still $84 billion, though. That's going to be a problem. We're going to hit next turn. Now, before I do that, notice how everything is red. This is because I have no political capital. That green and red is a visual indicator on how much you can influence that various different policy in that sector. So if I hit this, three months have passed, a new quarter. Education is down. We're going to have to look at that. Unemployment is up. Eh, we didn't really do anything. So, I mean, it's just like following the trends, man. Okay. Now, we have a couple of different things to look at here on the quarterly report. The first thing is any trends and the current situation of the six major things that are going to ultimately impact how we're getting elected um, is this. Reasonable force law. There is an urgent policy question that requires your immediate attention. Sometimes these random events that pop up have to do with policies you've implemented. Uh, situations have changed and these random quote unquote events are actually some somewhat tied to what you've done in the game. Other times they're things that have nothing to do with you. They were unavoidable anyway. These are things like foreign wars or accidents that may have happened on the road with high profile people, etc. All sorts of types of things can happen that are outside of your control or had nothing to do with you, but you still have to react to it because, well, you're the president. That's just the way it goes. In this case, there's a recent court case where a rural man shot and killed a teenage burglar in his own home and has, th has thrown a spotlight on the law regarding reasonable force when defending property, given that the homeowner was prosecuted for manslaughter. So let's let's TLDR that in case that didn't make sense to you. Uh, teenage boy, or I guess it's just a teenager, doesn't say boy, but um, teenage kid came into this guy's house to rob him. The guy shot the kid and killed him in his home while he was being robbed, and now the homeowner is being prosecuted for manslaughter. So that's the situation. So we have three options for this. We can choose to tighten the definition of reasonable force. We can choose to expand the definition of reasonable force, or we can have unquestioned right to defend property. There's a narrative that goes with each one of these, and you have to make a choice. And you don't know the impacts of that choice until after you make the choice, but it will show you how that kind of impacts people's opinion of you during that process. Sometimes it's more than opinions. Sometimes it can affect membership uh, to various different groups. Sometimes it can actually affect supply. It can have a GDP effect, an environmental effect, etc. Let's read these. Tighten the definition of reasonable force. Nobody has the right to take a life of another, even if they defend their property. Human life has to come before property in all cases. We may not have such, uh, we may not have much sympathy for the burglar, but allowing people to violently take the law into their own hands is certainly not the solution. So this takes the pacifist approach. 
You shouldn't kill people no matter what. Property isn't that important. Okay? Defan we can expand the definition of it. It's clearly ridiculous that a frightened man, far from police, attacked by a violent criminal in his home would ever be arrested, let alone charged, even if the violent criminal dies. We need to clarify that every citizen has the right to use force to defend their property, regardless of what happens. This is sort of the traditional American approach to it, mostly. Unquestioned right to defend property. This is the this is the, the far-right extreme approach to it. We should make it clear that the police will turn a blind eye to whatever means homeowners employ to defend themselves. If a burglar gets machine gunned in another person's kitchen, well, that's just karma. Okay. Uh, we're going to choose the middle one here. Again, uh, I'm playing a game, not trying to tell you how the world should work. Uh, and so uh, just... Just be aware of that. There's a lot of things in this, and I'm not making a let's play on this because I don't trust you. <laughs> okay, YouTube, I don't trust you. Uh, I just don't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way, uh, or I'm sorry if that if that finds you not well. Uh, I tried this on Twitch twice with Democracy Three. Uh, didn't like the outcome. <laughs> so it's good if you're a cre if you're a content creator, you want to play this game. Have a clearly defined goal that you're seeking and then make decisions towards a goal instead of trying to like, you know, pass your political ideology onto the world because uh, that won't work, I guarantee it. All right, so I've chose reasonable force law. I've chosen to expand the definition. Liberals have a negative 8% um, apathy towards that. They, they, they have that opinion it's dropped by 8%. Conservatives and patriots up uh, on that decision as well. Okay. Um, also, the quarterly report had something else in it, and I missed it. Uh, there's a situation imminent. Probably should take a look at that instead of skipping it. It says, the data has shown that we will have a potentially bad situation, drug addiction, on our hands if we do not act soon. So these are the types of things that can happen if you ignore them. You have your priorities set somewhere else. So you've kind of ignored situations that are getting slowly out of control, or in some cases, even rapidly out of control. And... If you get to the start trigger, it'll trigger something bad and it gets even worse. People's opinions of you will probably drop. You're going to have to implement something that costs you something to fix the problem. You have a you have a crisis on your hands, right? Now, in this case, drug addiction is getting up there. OK, dropped for a little bit, but it's been steadily on the rise. And again, it's not my fault. All right. I just came into office right here. So this ain't my fault. But you're in charge now. So it is your fault. Because that's how the world works. No matter what the other guy did, if you're in power now and the crisis happens now, no matter if the policies of the previous guy messed it up for you, you're going to get the blame. Public eye is going to blame you, even if it's not your fault. So you got to fix it if, if you can. So unemployment, state health services, all these types of things affect. These are the causes for the drug addiction. And it'll give you a positive or negative effect on a negative situation. So in other words, anything that's green here, is contributing to the problem. Anything that's red here is contributing to the solution, okay? Because this is a negative thing. So armed police, uh, com community policing, drug enforcement agencies, narcotics availability is gonna, of course, contribute positively to drug addiction. Um, prison overcrowding is gonna, is gonna hurt this, increased poverty, and of course, unemployment. We should probably try to solve the unemployment problem. So let's see if we can solve the unemployment problem while also maybe expanding private health care. So we're going to go ahead and try that out. Now, the reason I want to expand private health care, uh, I think I'm going to ignore the rest of these. They're not that important. The reason why I'm going to expand private health care is a couple of reasons. Uh, for one, state health services. State health services is costing me $15 billion. Okay? It's costing me money. Private health care doesn't cost me any money. In fact, it gets me money because they pay taxes. Right? So it's a balance, right? Is private health care better than state health care? I don't know. Up for you to decide. But when it comes to the economics of the game, um, this is costing me money. The other one will cover the gap. So if I take, for example, this and I reduce it, you can see how capitalists right now, let's just take a look at the effects of private of state health care right now. The effects of this, currently we have a 31% popularity with voters. So state health services. Maybe they're not doing that well, you know? Maybe they're just not doing that well. And they're not uh, not very popular with voters. It's contributing to our health system, which is good. Health is going up. 
Capitalists aren't that, aren't that good with it. Uh, wealthy people don't really care. Um, they're generally, I guess, a little bit negative, but like it doesn't matter. Uh, socialists are a little bit positive, doesn't really matter. This is membership, right? And also income, right? Um, so private healthcare, this is hurting private healthcare. The more money we put into state healthcare, the less competitive private healthcare can be. As a result, they won't do as well, okay? It's also gonna dramatically increase health, but look at the money that it costs us, right? So there's a balance with this. You might want to increase state healthcare, but it might cost you so much money. So I can reduce this if I want to just a little bit. Now I know that's gonna hit health a little bit, but what I'm hoping to do is to free up some money so that I can solve the health in other ways. So I'm just going to bring this down a little bit like that. Okay. It's going to cost me eight political capital to do that. Uh, the next thing I might do is I'm going to redirect some of our military spending towards social programs because I think it's a little bit high. Keep in mind, however, that we're in America. Okay. Popularity with military spending. It's pretty popular. And also Patriots, this group of people specifically, they tend to be the ones that, uh, well, let's just say they're incredibly passionate, okay? We'll just go with that. Military spending also has a positive influence on GDP. How so? Well, because it contributes to technology advancement. The overwhelming majority of all major technological advances that have had a huge impact on our society today have come, or at least in small part, from military funding and government funding through military programs. So military spending has a positive impact on technology development. Technology development is what we can do to make our economy more competitive. If we have lower technology, we will be less competitive. Um, I don't see that connection here, which is weird because their increase in technology should absolutely uh, play a role in having a competitive economy. So I'm not sure why that's not connected. Where is technology advancement in this technology right here? Interesting that that does not negatively contribute to an uncompetitive economy. That's a bit weird. Maybe it's more of an indirect thing. Skills shortage. It has it contributes to skills shortage, which then contributes to negative to GDP. So maybe that's how they've they, maybe that's how they've ultimately done it. Because there's a reason why it's an uncompetitive economy, and that's because of skills. So, uh, and also just lower technology makes us less competitive. The other thing that makes us less competitive is wages. If we implement high minimum wages or high corporate taxes and all that kinds of stuff, it makes us less competitive. Companies will go overseas for their wages, which is ultimately kind of what has happened. Uh, it's starting to come back, and that's good uh, through regulation. But generally speaking, and the game does sort of model this, but with these arrows, that if you increase wages in the country, it has a generally positive impact on the people. But capitalism-wise, it makes us less competitive uh, when it comes to labor. They may seek labor elsewhere where the wages are cheaper. So it does kind of model that. There's positives and negatives to almost everything you do here. For example, our good friend quantitative easing. If you're not familiar with quantitative easing, um, well, I'll just read it to you. Uh, a form of unconventional, actually become conventional now, uh, monetary policy where the central bank effectively prints extra money and uses it to purchase bonds and stocks. Isn't that nice? It can spur immediate economic activity, but also cause inflation and increase the wealth of the people who own stocks. This is why your money is worth a lot less today and quantitative easing tends to be very good for people who are already wealthy and who already own equities. People who do not own stocks and do not own equity, they tend to suffer from this because their money isn't really, it's just getting weaker. Um, so if you want inflation, just jack up the quantitative easing. You'll solve your economy problems in no time and then you'll kill your country. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, I'm going to redirect, like I said, a little bit of military spending. It's going to be a little less popular, but it's pretty expensive. So we're going to bring this down to a highly trained force. And we're going to go about like, I can't go too far because Patriots are really starting to like, I'm going to have to do other things for Patriots because if I make them angry, you know what I mean? I'm going to bring this down to about here, I think. Now, it's a very popular policy. So I've kind of just reduced a popular policy that's not going to be very popular let's make sure i make the capitalists happy though because they're the ones that are going to vote for me the most so one of the things i could maybe do is start looking at like art subsidies and maybe saying hey we don't need this 
eh, I'd rather not do that. It's not very meaningful, right? Um, the other thing I could do is maybe help parents. I find, when I've been playing around and playtesting this, that any policy I implement that helps parents' opinions of me generally helps everyone else's opinions of me too. Go figure, think of the children, okay? Um, parents' biggest concern is respiratory disease. So reducing tobacco usage is good, reducing car usage is good, and ultimately respiratory disease, um, if we lower this, we increase productivity. Because um, respiratory disease has a negative, uh, a negative effect on productivity, and productivity is pretty important for your economy. Um, there's a lot of elements to that. So let's help the environment a little bit, and I'm going to take a look at car usage, air travel, clean energy subsidies. GDP has a negative effect. That conflicts with what we're trying to do. We want the GDP to be up, and the higher we make it, the uh, the worse this is going to get. So we have to find ways to balance it out, and that might mean taking away money from certain places. So uh, I might look at that. I might also bank some of my political capital, but right now I have ten left. So why don't we take a look and pay for some of our programs? Maybe we'll raise capital gains just a little bit. Capitalists aren't too mad about that. They're not too mad about that. Um, we can go up to about 15%. It doesn't cost us much. So I think we're going to go about there. It doesn't cost us much. Um, we're raising money. I'm trying to solve the deficit so that I can invest in programs that will help other areas. Um, let's take, actually take a look. So I don't know if anything here that I want to really do. I could probably invest in some infrastructure. I could. I don't have a whole lot left, so you can see that this area is red and this area is red. It means I don't have enough political capital to affect that that far. Um, so it's going to cost me more than I have. But the green area, I'm totally good with using. Um, I think the thing is, if I increase infrastructure, that's going to increase car usage, which is going to improve, or it's going to increase traffic congestion, which will then also uh, mean more CO2 emissions. So instead of that, why don't we incentivize people to use cleaner cars? How about we take a look at transport and how about just carpooling in general? Car usage will drop. Ooh, fuel efficiency standards uh, is, tends to be pretty effective at minimal cost, but capitalists don't like it and I kind of need to make them happy. <laughs> I like this. Telecommuting, uh, telecommuting initiative, right? So working from home, incentivize working from home. Uh, it's going to cost us about 700 million or so, but it reduces car usage, makes parents happy, which is what I want. Uh, industries, whole industries are helped by this. Commuters uh, like me more, uh, mostly because car usage drops, so their commute is easier. And uh, productivity also improves by this. So let's implement this policy. And um, one thing I want to do, I think, is just to weigh the pros and cons of bringing uh, this higher. So right now it's a $3 billion program. I've, I'm... I've raised that money by reducing spending other places, so I could potentially make this happen. Um, raising and lowering this is free right now. Raising and lowering it later will cost me political capital. I am just now implementing this policy and it cost me a fixed rate of six. So this is, I have to figure out where I want to start it and then it costs me political capital to adjust it later. So I think I might go ahead and just maximize this out because it's gonna increase productivity. And um, I, I think that's probably good. So we're just gonna max this out and hit apply. We have that um, that health issue though, right? Drug addiction, we probably should do something about that today. Um, I just actually reduced, I, I reduced state health services, which has a better effect on private healthcare and private healthcare is more effective at dealing with drug addiction than state healthcare is. State healthcare has a lot of things going on. Um, private healthcare, they can they tend to be they can be more specialized. They can have an entire business that's related to that kind of thing, right? Um, so they, they they can it's what it, I'm assuming that's the the logic behind this. I don't know that. Um, there's a lot of things that are tweaked in here that I don't necessarily agree with uh, in the game. So I'm not entirely sure how the developers are, you know, judging what effects some things have on other things. Like for example, um, parents. If I hover over top of parents, where is education in this at all? Where is any indication whatsoever that education impacts parents' opinions of me? It's just not there. It's just not existent. Like I could raise and lower education and it doesn't seem to have any effect on parents. That feels really weird. Um, so like certain things like that, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you why the decision was made that way. 
Um, so yeah, I, I could bank this, but there's a there's a maximum to what I can actually have per turn. But I think six is a good enough for carryover. So why don't we go ahead and carry that over, and we'll let that run. And unless there's one more thing I could do, potentially let's make capitalists happy a little bit here. Um, why don't we? Okay, we could look at a, a tourism ad campaign. That's relatively inexpensive. It'll help our foreign relations and also increase tourism. And we already have a tourism problem in our country um, because of uh, strict border controls. So there's already a tourism effect in the United States uh, within the game. Uh, as far as like how it is in real life, I'm not going to get into that. Um, but in the game, we already have a big negative impact because of border checks. Uh, but the tourism campaign uh, might work. So let's implement this really quick. And if I increase tourism and I increase foreign relations, that's going to help us. Uh, as well. So I'm going to go with like, say, just barely in the maximum and go. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next turn. All right. So at least it's not rising anymore. Should probably deal with crime a little bit too. Um, our budget deficit went down. That's good. Some policies take a while to implement. So it might be several, several different turns before it's fully in effect. Uh, that improves, that might improve our budget as well. Uh, and there's also children's food. So there's an urgent policy question that requires our immediate attention. The law has been proposed to regulate the fat, salt, and sugar content and nutritional value of food sold to children, including sold, food sold in fast food restaurants and, of course, food served in schools. This is likely to incur costs for the food retailers. So, again, I'm not going to tell you the right way to do things, the wrong way to do things. I'm going to look at the overall picture within the game space and my ultimate goal of improving certain, very certain things. Let's read both of these options. Leave the law unchanged. You cannot interfere with the free market. This is the state interfering in people's lives. If kids want to eat fatty junk food and their parents don't mind, then who are our politicians to tell them not to eat hamburgers? or we can regulate children's food. Obesity is a major problem, which is a severe impact on people's health. Marketing unhealthy food uh, to people as such an early age is unacceptable, and we should pass the law now to safeguard the future health of our citizens. I am gonna let parents figure out what's good for their kids. That's what I'm gonna do. Now, it's gonna have a negative effect on health. We're gonna do this on other ways. Uh, liberals like us for this. That's good because we're not interfering with their lives. That's what liberal really is. We're keeping government out of their lives a little bit more. Um, parents tend to not really feel as favorable of us. I don't know why I'm, uh, you know, letting you decide for your own kids. So, okay, sure. I guess you don't like me. Uh, and obesity, obesity apparently goes up because parents are irresponsible, I guess. Again, n some of these things, they don't really make much sense, but I can kind of understand it, I guess. I guess there's a re the reason why the obesity epidemic exists in the first place is because parents aren't that smart, I guess. Um, let's take a look at... Uh, I want to raise this GDP up. We have a security briefing. Let's take a look at that really quick. This is a security screen. There's various different groups uh, in the world that um, maybe are against us, if you will. Um, they pose a threat, let's say. And the more effective our security force is, the better we're going to be able to protect against ourselves. Some of these guys are going to campaign against us, cause a stink, uh, picket, um, increase their membership to be negative against us, run ad campaigns, fund our political opponents, all that kinds of stuff. Some of these groups, though, going with the guns, they're more militant. They're more violent. They're more likely to maybe assassinate us. Um, I'm not saying that these ones are less important than these ones, um, but, uh, well, assassination does end the game. So uh, keep that in mind. Now, we have various different things that we could do to improve our security. Uh, for example, if we wanted to implement curfews, we could. Uh, detention without trial is inactive. We're not going to implement that. Uh, police drones, internet censorship, wiretapping, secure uh, secret courts, uh, torture usage by secret service and I don't know if any of that stuff actually impacts our security. Um, that's just what's in the game. Um, we're not really mass rolling out tasers at the moment. We do have intelligence services, although it's not necessarily fully funded. Um, firearm laws are pretty laxing at the moment. Um, CCTV cameras are not everywhere, right? 
We do have full press freedom, and that's helping corruption, which should help us. Um, and then we have armed police, which is good too. So as we go through the game and as you make decisions, certain groups are not necessarily going to like you. Um, and if you keep pissing them off, they might rally against you, right? So you have to watch that as you play the game as well. Okay, so I'm gonna play a couple of turns here to try to improve GDP um, and also improve the environment. And, um, and we also need to make sure that we're improving um, the, the economy. Like, check this out, legalized sex work. Look at all the effects that this has, right? Legalizing sex work has no potential income. I find that weird. I mean, if we're legalizing it, that means we're regulating it, which means we tax it. Why is that not increasing my income? Well, it kind of, Mm, it, it kind of inadvertently, like it increases our income indirectly, like by raising GDP. Um, liberalism goes up because, hey, we're legalizing something that was previously illegal. So we're getting out of people's lives a little bit more. Capitalists like it because they can now market it as a private service and make profits on it. It raises gender equality. It improves tourism. Uh, Self-employed membership goes up because people can now become sex workers and open, I guess. They're self-employed. <laughs> um, religious people are not going to like this as well, as you can understand. Parents tend to not like this decision. Conservatives, of course, will not like this decision. And ultimately, this will have a negative effect on crime, because now these people are not criminals anymore. Yeah, because they're only criminals because we made it illegal. So there's certain things I could do with this. It's 50% uh, popularity with this, and it doesn't cost me anything, and it makes... Uh, GDP go up and capital is happy. I'm going to do that. There you go. Legalized sex work is a thing. I have no idea, like, why there's a slider on this, though. Um, it doesn't cost me anything, so I might as well have the maximum effect, right? So religious and conservatives are going to hate me for this. But uh, everything else seems to work just fine. I don't know. Like, whatever, I guess. That cost me a ton of political capital, though. And private interest groups are probably not going to like me. <laughs> I imagine. Well, let's go ahead and one more one more turn. Let's see. Sexual assault. Okay. Health dropped as well. There is a national outrage as a woman's sexual assault on public transport is widely reported. Violent crime against women is abhorrent. That rape could be committed in public. That rape could be committed in public without anyone interceding is a damning indictment of our society. The electorate are demanding that lawlessness and gender inequality be addressed by the government. I literally just implemented a policy that raises gender equality. Did I not? I'm pretty sure I just did. Uh, and also we've had a major donor abandon the party. Oh, we didn't make one of our donors happy. Oh no. So one of our donors has left. We have fundraising efforts that we need to do, of course, to raise up our efforts against the no going back party. And uh, we have top party donors. We have to make them happy usually or they'll leave. New donors will pop up uh, with leanings towards the things that you've implemented. So, like, they do come and go. Um, but generally, if you want to keep the the big money behind your campaign, you got to make them happy. So, environmentalist, patriot, uh, poor, and capitalist. That's a weird combination for sympathies. Uh, and then commuter and liberals, okay? So, cool. We'll just try to make them happy, I guess. Uh, and global economy is doing well. Now, this is the global economy is doing well, all right? That's this. It's kind of dropping, but it's still doing well. Our relative GDP, relative to the global economy, though, ours is rising a little bit, right? GDP rose. The global is falling I like that. Okay, cool. Um, we still have a AAA credit rating. That's probably going to drop soon. Interest rate is 1.7%, and... What we want to do is reduce that deficit uh, if we can. Yeah, which is going to be hard to do without raising taxes. Um, so like, I don't want to do that, but um, I might. So let me play on with this a little bit. I'm going to see about raising GDP and getting all that stuff going. And I will be right back. This video is very long, but I want to show you the effects and what I've kind of put in and what I can do. So give me a second. I'll, uh, I'll be right back and see if I can get that. All right, I've played through a few turns and I'll, uh, I'll show you what I've done so far. Um, but we have this little event here that says child labor law. Uh, too many of our, of our younger citizens are leaving school early in order to take up low paying jobs. Some are even skipping school to work full time when they should be learning. The law is currently very weak with regards to preventing companies from employing under 16s in full time positions. This proposed law would make it a criminal 
offense to knowingly employ someone under 16 for more than five hours a week. So it's giving us three choices here, criminalize child labor, leave law unchanged, or compromise. Let's read the options. It says, we can make speech uh, we can make speeches about how children should be in school until we're blue in the face, but unless we back up our words with legislation and the threat of criminal action, our children will continue skipping school to earn money. We must back this law for the sake of the children. Okay. Uh, we can either leave the law unchanged. It says the law is unnecessary. Children who are skipping school are unlikely to be those who would pay attention in class anyway, and they are contributing to the economy by working instead. Also, we are running the risk of criminalizing small businessmen who may not know the age of the people they employ on a casual basis. Okay, so some other things to consider there, and that's like it's requiring companies to have extra paperwork and investigate things more clearly, etc. There's things to consider. Compromise. There's a good argument on both sides, so let's compromise and just tighten the law slightly so that the children can work no more than 10 hours a week, and that makes everybody happy, right? <laughs> so... Again, these are types of things that you have to look at with a game like this because not every issue is black and white, right? Not every issue is like, that's a good thing or that's not a good thing. Um, great example of this uh, related to child labor laws uh, would be during like the Victorian age where kids would work in factories and things and go out. And honestly, that kind of still happens in China too, where uh, really young people in really poor Chinese homes will go out and work in factories and work in assembly lines and things like that uh, to create products for Americans, right? And you might think, well, outlawing that practice is the best option. On paper, it seems like kids should not be doing that. And everyone can probably agree that putting kids in, in dangerous situations is a bad call. But there is actually a negative to removing such a law or to implementing a law that says they can't work. A lot of those families, right, are so poor, they really depend on the income from that extra worker in the family. Mom goes to work, dad goes to work, the kid goes to work. They're so poor and they're making such low wages, they depend on that extra income to eat and to pay their rent and survive. If you outlaw that practice, you're removing an income source from a home. And now, again, there's a lot of areas where you can look at something and say, that's just bad. I don't care if it, it's, it removes an income source, they need to get better jobs, etc. It's so complicated. For individuals, it's complicated. For a gross over, over policy, absolutely. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't have child labor, like child labor laws, this, this is a no brainer. But for the family that's depending on that income, it's not so black and white. And that's where certain conditions where just talking to people, seeing other perspectives, it doesn't mean you have to change your mind on the policy, but at least you're aware of how other people feel about certain situations. And that's sort of where the game can kind of like maybe not get into it quite as, mu quite as much. Like for example, people who are poor depending on that income doesn't really say that in here, right? Um, so just take taking that under a, a thing. I'm not trying to monologue you. I'm just saying that every issue that we encounter today there are comp there are complexities to that issue. I don't really honestly care which one I do here. Um, we're gonna go ahead and say compromise, and it probably just impacts GDP one percent. Big deal. Um, so there we go. Uh, and now I have a cabinet member that doesn't um, isn't happy with me necessarily because he's uh, his supporters are liberals and middle income earners. So maybe I've done something that help doesn't help middle income earners. But I've raised health. It's uh, it's a little bit higher now. GDP is a little bit better. Unemployment is kind of the same. It's not really going up very much. Um, education is a hard one to really raise on a short-term basis. It takes a while to make that go up. Um, and crime is reduced. Um, so I'll, I'll walk you through some of the things I might have done. Oh, Festival of Firearms. You can never really trust a person who doesn't absolutely love guns. What? We now have more guns in the country than we do dogs, cats, people, and birds combined. We finally did it. We are number one in guns, guys. Go team. Okay. What the heck? Uh, I was playtesting some things earlier too, and I've got Subsidy Sam, I've got Spotlight Junkie, and Shuffle Meister. Uh, so I, there's other different achievements that you could get for that too. Okay. I'm not sure how we got extra guns, but you can take a look at some of the people who really don't like me um, and some of the people who really do. And, um, you know, obviously I've got some ministers here that don't that don't like me so much. And uh, I've been trying to like, again, the balance of trying to increase GDP while not pissing off capitalists 
making sacrifices to do that, um, or sorry, raising GDP and pleasing capitalists while also trying to improve the environment. That part has been, it's been pretty challenging. Um, my approval rating and stuff has gone up pretty dramatically though. And um, some of that stuff has to do with new uh, donors and stuff and new ministers, new focus groups that are, um, that are liking me. But ultimately I'm just trying to make capitalists happy. And that's the complexities of this game. There's a lot to this. You can really dive deep uh, and get into critical systems that are maybe not 100% real in terms of real life. And of course, every country is different. Um, the interworkings and complexities of government are all very different. This is the game, Democracy 4. And um, if I keep going with this, I don't know if I would get elected. Um, it says my economy is doing well. My security briefing, I have managed to somehow reduce this. And religious people hate me. You can see religious people really hate me. Um, most of that has to do with uh, secularity of education. Um, I have a science emphasis for my public school system. And um, I can also increase this to just be even more if I want to. And then religious people will hate me. Um, there's another one which was already implemented. I didn't do this. It was already in the game, but there's an abortion law in here. Um, and of course, right now it requires two doctors approval. If I was just like no limit, just watch religious people just absolutely hate me <laughs> for doing that. Um, so there's like a lot of, there's a lot of things in this game and that's, that's where I'm getting at here. Um, so check it out if you'd like to, you can play it. it it's yourself. It's down in the description. Right down there, there's a link. Um, again, special thank you to Pasta Tech Games for sending me out a copy and letting me show with you guys. It is very difficult to present a game like this and try to stay as neutral as possible in my own sort of like dialogue uh, about certain topics of things. But hopefully I did an okay job with that. Thank you very much for watching. I very much do appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about the game, uh, if you'd like, maybe we can stream it. I can maybe try. We'll see if you wanna see more of the game and you wanna progress past elections and stuff together let me know in the comments uh i'll be willing to try it one more time if there's enough interest in it okay see ya bye bye